Okay. Hello, everyone. We are back with chapter 10. And this is always a exciting topic. We're going to talk about the dynamics of interpersonal relationships. And here are some of the topics that we're going to cover. We're going to look at why do we form relationships and then the models of relationship of relational dynamics and then communicating about each of our different types of relationships. And so these are the learning objectives that we're going to cover. We're going to recognize the various reasons for entering into interpersonal relationships. We're going to describe the stages and the dialectic tensions that are typically experienced in an interpersonal relationship. And then we're gonna identify specific skills uh, communicators can use to maintain and to improve their interpersonal relationships. So let's start off. So relationship is one of those terms uh, that people use all the time, but it's kind of hard for them to define it. If you ask somebody to define like what is a relationship, they're probably gonna have a difficult time coming up with a concrete definition. Even the scholars who study it and have been studying it for the duration of their career, they don't always agree on what the definition is or they have a hard time coming up with just one concrete term. But some of the words that they use as definitions include closeness, influence, commitment, intimacy. And so they all kind of incorporate these words within the overall definition. So we're kind of going to explore you know, some of these reasons of why would we form a, a relationship. So, you know, first off, you know, sometimes we don't really have a choice, you know, children can't select who their parents are. So that's not really a relationship that you get to pick, whether you like it or not, unfortunately. And then the same can go if you work somewhere. You don't always get to pick who you work with, who your coworkers are. So that's another type of relationship that maybe isn't up to you because you have to work with the people that are on your team, whether you like it or not. But in other instances in your personal relationships you get to choose the type of people that you want to hang out with the the people that are going to be in your close-knit circle of friends and the people that you're going to associate with outside of work and so one of the first things that they kind of talk about is like an initial thing that we might be attracted to on why we would form a relationship with someone. And the first thing that a lot of people judge people on is appearance. So this is usually kind of superficial, but it's one of the important things in the beginning stages of a relationship. But if you think about it, this probably becomes less important the more the relationship progresses. You know, because physical appearance uh, maybe might be a basis for why you're initially attracted to someone, but then maybe as you get to know them, it might change over time and you might find other things that you're attracted to them about. And next would be like similarities. So the similarity thesis states that the strongest determination of if you're going to have relationship formation is if you have similarities to another person. So essentially, do you have things in common with them? Um, because then you're going to feel validation with them. And, you know, this is going to make us feel like we're connected to them and we're going to feel like they are like us in some way. And so in turn, we are also going to like them. And so that can be another big determining factor when we meet somebody. In one study, they found that uh, similar values about politics and religion are one of the predictors of when you're selecting someone to date. Um, obviously, those are important things that you're looking for. And, you know, this can be even generally it's rated higher, you know, than just physical attractive, uh, you know, how attract, 
physical attractiveness and appearance is usually not as important as politics and religion and things that are, you know, more on the deeper basis, like we we're kind of talking about before. And then also uh, next we have complementary. So this describes a state in which each partner's characteristics satisfy the other person's needs. And so that would be another reason why you might form a relationship with someone. So that's kind of the old saying like opposites attract. And it's, you know, the contradiction, it's a contradiction of similarity. So in truth though, both, both of these are valid differences can really strengthen a relationship because you know they complement each other and they can each satisfy somebody else's needs maybe you're looking for someone to kind of counteract you or to balance you out in some areas and so that might be why you would form a relationship with somebody who is opposite to you in things maybe that you're weak at or in areas that you know you um don't have as many interests in maybe it's intriguing to you another thing that is going to make a difference is going to be rewards so some relationships are based on an economic model called social social exchange theory so this approach suggests that we seek out people who can give us rewards that are greater than or equal to the cost we encounter in dealing with a relationship. So this kind of defines rewards as in any outcome that we desire. So this could be a tangible thing like a nice place to live, a high paying job, but it also could be an intangible thing. It could be emotional support or companionship or something along that line. So you're still getting some sort of reward out of it. And, and that's, you know, what is desirable to you in that situation. But you also have to look at, they have a like a formula to what is desirable within this. So when you're looking at it, they say a simple formula captures the social exchange explanation for why we form and maintain relationships. So it's basically rewards minus cost equal outcome. So according to this theory, we use the formula and we do this without thinking about it to calculate whether a relationship is a good deal or if it's not worth the effort and based on whether the outcome is going to be positive or negative. So when you think about this, this might feel kind of cold because you're thinking about exchanging things with somebody in a relationship and you might you know maybe you don't think about things like that uh but in some types of relationships this can be appropriate for example in a business relationship this is really going to be based on how well one party can help somebody else and in some friendships, it can be based on like bartering. And so, you know, people don't really mind if, it, if it's a give and take type of situation. And so maybe, you know, one person helps you repair your house and then the other person has another skill set that they do and give to, back to the other person. Maybe it's emotional support or listening or whatever the other person is you know, giving back in within the relationship. And then another area uh, that we might look for is competency. We like to be around talented people because we hope other skills and abilities are going to rub off on us. So we want to be around people who are competent and you know, maybe people that we can learn from or have a different skill set than we do. But on the other hand, we can sometimes be uncomfortable around people that are too competent. So if, if it's around somebody that is maybe really smart or really good in a, a certain area that you don't understand, it might make you look bad or it make you, might make you feel uncomfortable. And so that could be a, an instance where maybe 
you don't want the person to be, I guess, too competent or overly competent in something, or maybe it's something that you know nothing about. And so you can't add value to the conversation in a particular area. But we're attracted most to confidence in others when it's, you know, goes with a, a warm personality rather than somebody who has a cool personality. And then proximity. So proximity matters because we are likely to develop re relationships with people that we interact with frequently, which I, I think this just kind of makes sense. Like if you see somebody, you know, more often, maybe at work or in your building, if you have a neighbor that you see all the time or in your friend group or at a local place that you hang out, it's just, you know, more convenient and you're around them. So you're most likely going to talk to them more or potentially form a relationship because you keep seeing them in the same places or in the same area and it's convenient. And then disclosure. So this involves telling others important information about yourself, sharing important information. Uh, you know, this will breed respect and trust. But we talked about this in some of the previous, you know, chapters a little bit about like self disclosure, you have to kind of make sure that it's a give and take situation that both people are giving disclosure and it's not like a one way street that only one person is giving it. So it's important to have a reciprocating, re re you know, relationship going back and forth. But timing is also very important in successful self-disclosure and that it's an appropriate setting and time because that can make a difference in how successful it's going to be in the relationship. Because if it's not an appropriate time or a good setting, then it might not be well received. Unfortunately, when we talk about the, you know, the social exchange theory, a negative could be um, the dark side of communication. And so they kind of started to talk about, you know, abusive relationships and how the give and take of that could occur. And, you know, so the book was talking about it would be nice if all of our relationships were happy, healthy, and, you know, supportive, but we all know that's just not the reality. Unfortunately, in some relationships, it can be abusive and people can, you know, have mental, emotional, verbal, sexual, or physical abuse, and that can leave scars and, you know, emotional impacts and trauma long after a relationship is done. And so, you know, many abusive relationships don't end when they should. And why do people stay in them? You know, social exchange theory offers some sort of explanation. So abused partners often believe that a bad relationship is better than no relationship at all. So they may also have trouble seeing viable relational, relational alternatives because their perspective gets lost and, you know, they just kind of rationalized what's happening and then the pain just keeps reoccurring so research has shown that people in abusive dating relationships underestimate how unhappy they really are and they overestimate how happy they would be if the relationship was to end and so you know that can be one explanation why people don't leave as quickly and it perpetuates in that situation, you know, so it, it can be hard to see what's occurring at the time too, when you're in that situation, you don't really, I think, understand how bad it is until maybe you do get to leave and you reflect back and you really see, oh, like objectively what was happening. And then, you know, that can just be such a difficult situation. Next, we go into 
this isn't something that I was always pretty interested in. It's it's quite a long explanation of each of these stages. Uh, it's the models of relational dynamics. So this kind of goes through each of the areas of a relationship and each of these stages. So I'll go through each of these. So even the most stable relationships vary from day to day and over a long period of time. So communication scholars have attempted to describe and explain how communication creates and reflects the changing dynamics. Um, so, you know, one of the best known models of the relational sta stages is was developed in this model. And so we'll go through and start with the first one. So initiating. So the goals in the initiating stage are to show that you are interested in making contact and to determine that you are a person worth talking to. So communication during this stage is usually brief and is generally followed by conventional formulas like handshakes, uh, you know, kind of like surface level topics about like the weather maybe or friendly expressions. So it's kind of like that superficial talk and it's generally pretty meaningless. Um, but it is a way of signaling that you're interested in building some kind of relationship with the other person. It allows us to say without saying, I'm a friendly person and I'd like to get you get to know you. That's just kind of what you're saying at this point. Initiating relationships, especially if it's a romantic one, can be particularly difficult for people who are shy. So, you know, social media and texting and other digital mediums have made this a little bit easier. If you are shy, you may not have to do this face to face anymore. And so I guess that might make it easier for you than it used to be. In one survey, it said more than a third of 19,000 married respondents said their relationship began online, which is not surprising to me at all. And I'm sure that's not surprising to you. So, but keep in mind that the initiating stage is the opening stage of all relationships. We're not just talking about rom romantic relationships. We're talking about friendships or any relationship in general. So friendships start here, business partnerships, you know, just any relationship in general. Next, after, if you go from this stage, you go to the next stage, which is called experimenting. So after you make contact with an interesting person, we enter the next phase, which is experimenting. So this is where you're kind of looking for like common ground or common interests. So we kind of start with like basic questions here. Where are you from? What is your major? You know, looking for similarities within the other person. What do you like to do for fun? What are some of your hobbies? Oh, you like to run? I like to run too. You like to exercise? I like to exercise too. How many miles a week do you run? What gym do you go to? I have three brothers. You have, how many brothers do you have? Just like those questions that you probably ask most people when you're first trying to get to know them. So, you know, the hallmark of this stage is really like small talk. <laughs> so, you know, we tolerate the ordeal of small talk because it serves several different types of functions. First, it's a it's useful way to find out what interest you can share with another person. It also provides a way to kind of audition the other person. And so this helps us decide whether a relationship is worth pursuing. In addition, small talk is kind of a safe way to ease into a relationship because you haven't really, it's not like high risk. You're not risking very much as you decide if you want to proceed further with this person. And so, you know, your experience probably confirms if you're going to move further with this relationship and, and that's what you're kind of trying to feel out at this point. And sometimes, you know, you might even use social media to obtain information about this person. Maybe you look them up online. 
Because I would say online, you can definitely learn a lot about somebody. Next, we go from the experimenting stage to the intensifying stage, which is kind of exactly what it sounds like. You are starting to kind of go in deeper, increasing contact with the person. So communication is going to increase the breadth and the depth of your self-disclosure. So in friendships, this could include, you know, you're spending more time together. Maybe you're um, going to have more shared activities. Maybe you start hanging out with mutual friends, or maybe you're going to start like planning trips together. When you start dating with somebody, this could be, you know, a wide range of things as well. So maybe at this point, maybe you start to say, I love you to someone. Or maybe it's just like things like um, doing favors or other like showing your affection in other ways, expressing feelings non-verbally. Maybe you're trying to get to know the person's friends and family. It, it could be all sorts of different things. So the intensifying stage is usually a time of relational excitement and euphoria. In friendships, it's about enthusiasm because you have a new BFF. For romantic partners, it's often filled with starstruck gazes, goosebumps, daydreaming. As a result, it's a stage that you know is in movies. It's kind of like the lovers in love stage. The problem, of course, is this stage doesn't last forever. So this is can be like the honeymoon stage sometimes um so people can kind of be in that stage like for a little while but it doesn't always last unfortunately <laughs> next um integrating so integrating is really where the relationship is going to start to strengthen and you know move to a next level so in this stage, you are going to identify as a social unit. So invitations begin to come address as a couple. So you might make even bigger commitments like, hey, we're going to spend Thanksgiving and Christmas with your family and then do this with my family. And then you might even start looking at common property like our apartment, our car, our song, our this, our that. And, you know, kind of like blending things together and your identity as a couple. Like you might start jogging together, eating at favorite restaurants, worshiping together, doing all these things that are kind of like yours you and the couple as a unit and so you're kind of like forming identity with another person and integrating everything as one exactly what it you know kind of says and you know sometimes people will at this point make it like official on social media if they want to it, it really depends on the couple on if they want to be public about things online and you know when people feel comfortable doing this during the bonding stage this would be when you make a symbolic and a public gesture to show the world that your relationship exists and that a commitment had been made. So this is like engagement, marriage, uh, a public ceremony, or a written or verbal pledge. So the key to bonding is like really officializing of a couple's integration. But the relationships don't have to be romantic again to achieve bonding. So for instance, if an author contracts to write a book or a student begins to initiate into a sorority, that's an example that's not romantic. Or in some cultures, there are rituals for friends to mark their bonding status through a public commitment. So bonding usually marks an important turning point in a relationship. So up to now, the relationships may have developed at a steady pace. 
and you know moved from experimenting into intensifying into integrating but now there is like a specific in public declar declaration that shows exclusivity and this is like a critical period in the relationship so this is us kind of like going up the ladder and all these like you know working up to the point of coming together and then next if things start to not go so great you kind of go down the ladder and you start to come apart unfortunately so if you start to differentiate um this is where you know development starts to decline so and there's kind of like dissolution starts in a relationship so even in committed relationships, you know, partners can find themselves needing to reestablish their individual identities and they may start to differentiate. So this transition shows up in a couple's pronoun usage. So how we were talking about before when people might say our plans, our weekends, are this, they might start to say I want to do this. I'm going to do this. And they might really make it a point to really only talk about what they want to do and not what they're doing as a couple. So relational issues that were once agreed upon, like such as you're going to be the breadwinner, I'm going to stay home, could maybe now be an issue. Like that person might be like, why am I stuck at home? when I have, you know, other, I could have had career potential and you get to go to work. So, you know, that's causing, causing issues now. But it could also be positive considering that people need to be individuals as part of a relationship. So think for instance of young adults who want to forge their own, you know, unique lives and identities even while you know maintaining the relationships with their family so you know this can hold true for some international couples who want to stay connected to their individual culture and values as well as each other and you know it's can be part of normal relational maintenance in which partners manage you know challenges that come along the way but the key to successful differentiating in a in a relationship and still being committed to a relationship is creating space for each person to be an individual. Next is circumscribing. And in this stage, uh, you know, partners reduce the scope of their contact with each other. And the word, um, you know, circumscribe comes from the Latin meaning to draw circles around them. So, you know, the distinction that emerges in the differentiation stage becomes more clearly marked and labeled how people were saying my friends and your friends, my bank account and your bank account. So it's being very clear about what's yours and, you know, what's mine and what's yours. Those distinctions are becoming even more identified and they become a problem um, because it's very clear areas of separation rather than integration in a relationship. And so it's causing more space between you and the person and you and your partner. And then you go to um, stagnation. So if the stage above continues, the relationship is just going to become stagnant. So members behave towards each other in old familiar ways without much feeling. So no growth is occurring and relational boredom is setting in. So the stagnating relationship is a shell of what it used to be. So we see stagnation in many workers when they lose enthusiasm for their job, but they still continue to go through the motions for several years. And the same sad event occurs for couples who are not very enthusiastic with their partner, or maybe it, they just keep having the same conversations over and over. They see the same people, they do the same routines, but they're not, they're not doing it because they're happy or excited about it. 
they're just going through the motions and doing it over and over and over, but they're not feeling joy or excitement or any of the old feelings that they used to have about the relationship. And then next you go, if this continues, then it will go to avoiding. So when stagnation becomes too unpleasant, people in a relationship between they'll begin to create distance between each other by avoiding. Sometimes they do it with excuses like, oh, I'm, I'm sick and I can't see you. And sometimes they'll be like, I don't call me. I don't want to see you. So sometimes some people are more direct about it. and Other people kind of just like make ex excuses about reasons they can't hang out. But either way, you know, they're starting to avoid the other person or not want to hang out with them. Some relationships will completely stall out at this stage, like if it's a friend, a lover, a family member, and they'll just kind of like drift apart and they won't really or rarely interact again. Well, sometimes there's a natural parting of ways. Other times it leaves important things unsaid. And that can mean that there isn't really any closure if you just kind of like fade away from the other person. And then if you have term terminating, um, you know, not all relationships and partnerships, friendships and marriages, I mean, they can last for a lifetime, but, you know, some not everything can last forever once they're established. So, you know, some do reach the final stage. And in this stage, you know, the relationship has gone, is basically disso you're dissociated from it. It may end with a cordial dinner. It may end with a note left in the kitchen, a phone call, a text, a document. So it depends on the feelings uh, of each person. So this could be short and amicable, or it could be bitterly drawn out over time, depending on the circumstances. And then, you know, they're kind of looking at now how technology is influencing termin termination more than it used to be. And they said, uh, in one of the surveys of 1000 people, they found that 45% have used mobile devices to end a relationship through text, which is pretty sad, you know, I guess it's not that surprising that 45% of people have just sent a text to end a relationship. Because I mean, I'm sure people are uh, not happy by that. Because obviously, I would think they would at least want to maybe talk in person or phone call or something else beyond just a text. So that is a lot. I know a lot of things that can happen in a relationship. So we talk about two um, dialectic tensions. So not all of the theory, theorists and the scholars agree that these stages are the best way to explain relationships because they say it's you know possible for a relationship to have some attributes of both the coming together and coming apart stages at the same time. And maintaining relationships is about maintaining these competing goals. So some scholars call these struggles dialectic old tensions and conflict. These are the conflicts that arise when two opposing or incompatible desires exist simultaneously in a relationships. And so some of those things that can occur is the integration and separation dialectic. And this embodies the conflicting desires for connection and interdependence. And then the connection autonomy dialectic is where we want to be close to others, but we also seek to be independent. It's an internal struggle, struggle with ourselves. The inclusion seclusion dialectic is the external struggle between integration and separation. It attempts to 
reconcile desire for involvement with others outside the relationship, but also time together within the relationship. Then you have the stability change dialectic. This acknowledges that stability is an important need in a relationship, but too much of it can lead to feelings of staleness. We have the predictability novelty dialectic, and this is the tension within a relationship between wanting a predictable partner, but not wanting the relationship to be too boring. The conventionality uniqueness dialectic is the tension felt by people when they try to meet other people's expectations, but they also want to be true to themselves and who they are. The expression privacy dialectic, it captures the desires for intimacy and the need to maintain space between ourselves and others. Then we have the openness closeness dialectic. This is an internal struggle between expression and privacy. And then the re releva revelation and concealment dialectic is the external expression of conflict between openness and privacy. So these are all like tensions and things that can be, you know, constantly occurring that can influence, you know, the ebb and flows of the relationship. So, you know, managing dialectic tensions can be challenging, um, you know, so they have identified a number of communication strategies for dealing with them, but most of which are unconscious. In fact, the face of conflicting desires, some relation, par some relational partners choose denial and they pretend to themselves and one another that these conflicts are not even happening or exist. Some people compromise, but that can lead to issues if they feel like they're giving up too much and, you know, they can be caught in between conflicting desires. Yeah, and, and this is just what I'm talking about. Some of the different ways, you know, you can manage it, denial, compromise, alternating, compartmentalize, accepting, reframing, and reaffirming. So, you know, if you deny that these things aren't happening, if you compromise, and then, you know, if you choose one end of the spectrum at times and on the other end at, on other occasions, if you are good at compartmentalizing things, that might help, but maybe not. Some they say that a more rewarding approach is to accept and even embrace opposite desires. You know, they describe a couple who accepted both the needs for predictability and novelty by devising a predict predictability novel approach. Once a week, they would do something together that they had never done before. And so, you know, that was how they found a way to kind of adapt in that situation. And then like when families had step families, they would manage the tension between the old family and the new family by adapting and blending family rituals. Another, you know, way to manage these opposing desires is reframing them. Consider how a couple who felt hurt by one another's unwillingness to share parts of their past might reframe the issue as an attractive, like, mystery. So you might change your thinking. We're keeping secrets about our past. The partners might think those, se those secrets make things a little mysterious and exciting. So the desire for privacy will still remain but it will no longer compete with the need for openness about every aspect of your past. And when you reaffirm, instead of trying to make these things go away, reaffirming communicators accept or embrace the challenges that are present. So, you know, this is kind of looking at 
everything that's happening and and acknowledging that and embracing it. So communicating about relationships, so content and relational messages. So content is the subject being discussed. Relational information conveys how the communicators feel about each other. Relational messages are usually expressed non-verbally and through meta-communication, which describes messages that refer to other messages. Relational work refers to meta-communication focused on specific relational relationship issues. So maintaining and supporting relationships. Relational maintenance, uh, they, they have five strategies that have been identified. So you need to be have positivity and keeping things polite and upbeat and try to avoid be, you know, critiquing things or cr criticizing everything. Being open, talking directly about the relationship. Being a uh, providing assurance, let the other person know that he or she matters in the relationship. And then social networks involve being invested in each other's loved ones and, you know, the people around them. Sharing tasks, you know, helping the other person take care of chores and obligations. And social support, helping others out during challenging times by providing emotional information or instrumental resources. What are some, you know, relational transgressions that can occur? So, you know, re repairing damaged relationships can be challenging as problems can arise from external internal forces or from a relational transgression, which is when one partner violates explicit or implicit terms of a relationship. So what are types of relational transgressions? So one could be minor versus significant behavior. Um, so that needs to be considered. So examples could be small doses of jealousy or anger or that type of thing. So distances are not as harmful, but large amounts are. And then social versus relational behavior is also an, another consideration. Some transgressions violate social rules that are shared by society, while others are relational and violate the norms that are constructed by those involved in their relationship. And then there's deliberate versus unintentional behaviors that capture the notion that while some transgressions may not be considered, may not be consciously uh, intended, others are sometimes. And then you have a one time versus things that are, you know, continually happening and recognize that transgressions occur in a single episode while others can continue to occur over time. So how do you repair these relational transgressions that can happen? And you know, how can you fix it if you offend the partner and try to offer some sort of apology? So you, yeah, first start with an apology, which should consist of acknowledging your wrongdoing, uh, an offer of the repair, and a genuine expression that of regret. And so you want to make sure you discuss the violation and acknowledge that you did something wrong. And then you want to You know, sometimes realize that forgiving transgressions is difficult and, you know, forgiveness can take time, but it does have personal and benefits that are going to, you know, show up in the relationship opposed to you holding a grudge and hanging on to everything. So you want to try to hopefully forgive these things that happen because everybody makes mistakes and if somebody is 
offering an apology, acknowledging that they did something wrong and it's genuine, try to forgive them for what occurred. And they kind of said that if you do forgive somebody, you know, forgiveness has been shown to reduce emotional stress and aggression, and it actually can improve your overall health. And it says that most research shows that transgressors who have been forgiven are usually less likely to repeat their offenses than those who do not receive forgiveness. So this is a review of all that we covered. We recognize the various reasons for entering into interpersonal relationships. We describe the stages of dialectical tensions typically experienced in interpersonal relationships. We identify specific skills communicators can use to maintain and improve their relationship, interpersonal relationships. And that is all.